Uh, welcome everybody to the opening of the conference series on transitions for young people. This is the first session and we have several webinars, blogs and podcasts all about transitions for young people. And a very warm welcome to Linda Bryheim Crookall, who's head of the policy and practice development at Quorum Voice, which is part of the children's rights charity and part of the Quorum group. Linda came and spoke at our last in-person event, which uh, was two years ago, um, which was uh, Love in the Care System. And little did we know what was ahead of us then. So um, welcome back, Linda. Today, Linda's going to talk about the Bright Spots programme, which started in 2013 and covers 60 local authorities in the UK, including six in Wales. Linda's going to talk about young people in and leaving care and what makes life good for the leaving care transition. We'll take questions at the end of Linda's presentation. So if you post your questions in the chat, we can pose them to Linda at the end. So big welcome, Linda. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for having me. So yes, as Alison said, I'm going to be talking to you about some of the findings from the Bryce Boss Programme, which is a partnership between Quorum Voice and uh, the Reese Centre at the University of Oxford. Um, my colleague Julie uh, Selwyn from, from Oxford was um, at a previous um, Cascade um, seminar series talking about the experience of children in care and today I'm going to focus on some of the findings uh, around care leavers that uh, we've put together. So just to start us off, um, the um, main focus of the Bright Sports programme is um, children and young people as experts in their own lives. Um, as this young person told us, um, we need to listen to young people's views and thought. They know what's going on and, and often we don't. So we really take that focus on children and young people's views and experiences. What we found when we started to develop the Bright Spots programme was that many of the measures that are used by local authorities to um, explore how children and young people are doing in the care system focus on objective measures and professional assessments. Um, what it doesn't so much explore is children, care and care leavers' own viewpoints. Are they happy, safe and feel that they're doing well? And that's the gap that the Bright Spots programme tries to address. And it helps local authorities to systematically listen to their children and care and care leaders about the things that are important to them. So we do this by measuring subjective well-being, which essentially means feeling good and doing well at an individual and at an interpersonal level. And we measured this through our Bright Spots indicators, which were developed with children and young people. Uh, which are essentially are the questions in two uh, surveys, the Your Life, Your Care survey for children in care, age four to 18, and the Your Life Beyond Care survey for care leavers. So over the past seven years, we've worked with almost 60 local authorities to collect over 17,000 voices through the, these two surveys. And the approach that we take is very much about using young people's voices to and not only explore how they're feeling, but also to um, affect change in the care system. So we work um, initially very much on the local level with individual local authorities to help them understand how their children and young people are doing and feeling, and then using that feedback to develop responses locally and to hopefully try and improve their well-being over time. But we're really lucky because we've worked with so many local authorities uh, across the country that um, that also has given us a picture of children and young people's experience nat nationwide. So we have that national understanding of their well-being from their own perspective. It allows us to benchmark local authorities to compare how they're doing, their young people are doing compared to um, young people across the country, both. Uh, in terms of care leavers' um, own individual experiences, but also um, make comparisons against the general populations because some of the questions that we use are the same that have been are used in national surveys of young people in general. Okay. 
the key question in the Your Life Beyond Care survey really is what makes life good. We worked with care leavers in two local authorities to develop the initial survey. Uh, and they worked to identify what made their lives good. And we also work with them to then think about the questions that we should be uh, asking and what were the most important things to focus on. We tried as much as possible to ensure that the surveys are really ev strongly evidence-based. So we did a rapid review of research, exploring all the things that children and young people today have said about what was important to them and what was important to their well-being, so that that informed the workshops that we did with care leavers. We uh, carefully piloted um, the questions and used things like cognitive interviews to make sure that the care leavers who did the surveys understood the questions in the way that we intended, that they made sense to them, that they felt comfortable answering the questions. And we also worked with a survey design specialist to help us think about the ordering of questions, the wording, to make it as easy and quick for young people to complete as possible. And as I said, wherever possible, we've tried to use questions that are also the same as the ones that exist in national surveys so that we can compare how care leaves are doing to young people in general. I think one of the essential things about the survey is it's really focused on young people themselves. So it's not about how services are doing, but how children in care and care leaders feel that they're doing. Before I go into thinking about and describing what the um, things that we actually ask about are, just wanted to take a little bit of a moment to think about what makes life good in your life. Perhaps use the chat to sort of highlight some of those ideas, some of the things that you think uh, are important to make your life good. So as you can see from this diagram, which highlights all the different indicators, all the different questions that we ask care leaders, uh, probably many of the things that uh, you hi highlighted or thought about when you thought about things that made your life good, other things that are reflected in care leaders' lives. The people in their lives are really important. We ask about friendships, having people that you trust, someone who gives you emotional support, even whether you have a pet. And there are also things that are particular to care leaders, things about uh, being part of the, the system, um, your relationship with workers, how you feel involved in the planning that gets done. Uh, whether the reasons why you're in care have been fully explained. And also things about living independently. How care leaders are feeling about where they live. Is it right for them? Do they feel safe and settled? Are they coping financially? But also, do they have opportunities to have fun and goals and plans for the future? And what are they up to? And perhaps um, something that we've all recognised over the past year and a bit um, access to internet and phone was something that Kelly was really highlighted as an important thing for their well-being, not just in terms of the kind of practical day-to-day, -day, but also being able to engage with people in their lives and, and maintain positive relationships. We also explore feelings. So those are things around stress, anxiety, loneliness, and also how Kelly was feel about the way they look with positive and negative emotions. And then the things in the middle are a set of questions that are national indicators that the ONS use to explore well-being in the general population, whether you feel happy, uh, satisfied with life as a whole, and the things that you do are worthwhile. So again, it allows us to compare Kelly's well well-being to the general population. So what did we find when we analysed all of this data? Sorry, it's going a bit quickly. So last year, we published What Makes Life Good, Care Leavers' Views on Their Wellbeing, which is um, a report that pulled together the findings from the first 21 local authorities who did the Your Life Beyond Care survey. Just over 1,800 care leavers completed it. What we found was that care leavers did worse than the general population on a range of measures. 
as this Kelly was said, often we require more support in care than the general population because of our experience. And in reality, we get much less. Please fix that. So for example, we found that care leaves with higher anxiety, lower life satisfaction, felt lonelier, and were less likely to have a support, trusted and supported people in their lives. We also saw that there was a steep decline in well-being when young people left care. So we found that compared with children in care, a higher percentage of care leavers felt unhappy and unsafe and unsettled where they lived. A particular group that stood out in our findings were the care leavers who reported that they had a long-term uh, health problem or disability. We can see in our, in our data that care leavers were already much more likely than young people in the general population to report this. And that particular subgroup of the care leavers who completed the survey were particularly vulnerable. They were the ones who had lower well-being, were lonelier, and were less likely to have goals and plans for the future. And compared with other care leavers, fewer of them felt safe and settled where they live and more of them struggled financially. And overall, although a majority of care leavers had moderate to high um, well-being, there was a big chunk, about 30%, that had low well-being. And we did some additional analysis trying to explore the factors that were associated with high and low well-being. So the care leavers that had very high well-being, they were the ones who reported that they felt treated better or the same as other young people. So essentially suggesting that there's something about being a care leaver that had benefited them potentially. They felt proud and strong. They felt safe and settled uh, where they were living. They didn't feel lonely or afraid, had low um, levels of stress and bigger support networks, including partners, and felt optimistic about the future and happy with how they looked. Conversely, we, the care leavers with low well-being very much the opposite. So they're the ones that struggled financially, had um, much, many more negative emotions than, than positive, felt unsettled where they lived, um, experienced high levels of stress, lacked trusting and supportive relationships, and including good friends, and were more pessimistic about the future and unhappy with how they looked. But I think what uh, our finding shows is that the care system can get it right. So we can learn from those positive, with the positive experiences that those with high well-being have. Um, we also found that when we looked at individual local authorities, care leavers in some local authorities did better than others. So, for example, looking at uh, low well-being as an indicator, in the best performing local authority, only 14% of care leavers reported low well-being, when it, whereas in the lowest performing local authority, it was as high as 44%. And similar picture when it came to Kelly was feeling safe in their homes. In the best performing local authority, that was one in five who didn't feel safe. Whereas in the lowest performing local authority, it was up to um, half of the care leavers. Another positive message from, from the findings was that there were many young people who were really positive about the support that they received from the leaving care personal advisors. Care leavers reported higher levels of trust and more stability of workers compared with children in care. And this comment from, from a care leaver is, is, was really indicative of many of the comments that we, we saw. She's amazing, always goes above and beyond for you, always makes sure you're okay and lets you know that she's always around. So we made some recommendations based on those findings. And I think one of the first things that we felt was important was that we really need to start thinking much more about focusing on care leavers' own experience of the system and, and in their lives. And when we're thinking about implementing policy and practice improvements, that we should measure the success of those based on how young people feel about their lives. And the indicators can be a really good tool for doing that. 
because they focus on the things that are important to young people. You can use those uh, as a local or a national decision making to understand how care leaders feel about their lives and design services that better meet their needs. We also found that there were these key issues. So out of all of the different things that we asked about, these were the ones that were most strongly associated with well-being. And that gave us some suggestions in terms of some of the interventions that perhaps we should be focusing on. And I'm also going to talk through some of the examples from local authorities that we work with that explore some of these issues. So firstly, there seems to be a, a need to focus on improving connections and relationships in order to help Kelly feel less lonely, develop friendships and trusting supporting relationships. One quite simple example of, of an activity that one of the local authorities we worked with developed was the five-a-side football team in East Riding. Their care leavers, um, when they did the survey, said that they wanted more activity that they could do as a group. And we know that group activities can combat loneliness and help you feel part of the community. So they set up a five-a-side football team that meets on a weekly basis. And it's a way where kids uh, have to get there themselves, but it's funded by the local authority. And it's built a sense of community between the young people, allowing them to have fun. Um, and also showed how the local authority uh, were actually listening to young people and took action as a result of what they said. In the longer run, they hope that the group um, will be able to continue without staff being there. Second area that stood out from the findings was the need to support emotional uh, well-being and mental health, addressing stress levels, encouraging more positive rather than negative emotions, and helping young people to feel good about themselves and their future. So one example of some work that Isla White have been doing is their work around the, their community allotment. So we know that um, access to nature and hobbies and activities can reduce stress and improve well-being, and that gardening can be beneficial for mental health. So in the Isla White, they set up this community allotment that can be used by all children in care and care leaders. It's wrench free materials and plants are raised through community fundraising. And the local authority offers an award in horticulture as part of the allotment. It's also accessible, so there are raised beds for wheelchairs. And the way the local authority described this is it's a place where you can go, where you can socialise and learn. And because it's a community allotment, it also offers young, young people the opportunity to meet other people from the community and learn from them. And they have plans as well to sort of link the allotment to a therapeutic mental health group to develop a shed project where they can learn to make things from wood and pallets. The third area we um, feel that they need to focus in is providing money management and financial support for care leaders. Coping financially stood out as one of the areas that very really influenced how Kelly felt about their well-being. And it also sort of links to that um, finding around the young people who felt that they were treated the better or the same as other young people being uh, having very high well-being, potentially suggesting that uh, if being care leaver have, has benefited you in, in some way, that's associated with well-being. And it might be a sort of in, an indication that things like additional support for um, higher education or additional support to um, access the right accommodation, et cetera, could, could be some of the things that um, mean that care leavers um, are doing better. So there are a few examples of different things that local authorities have done around financial support. In Sheffield, they focus very much on raising awareness about the experience that care leavers have and the struggles around coping financially. So they set up something called the reality check project. In Sheffield, like in other um, areas across the country, um, their care leavers were three times more likely to struggle financially than the general population. And their care leaver group developed the reality check project 
So it was essentially a challenge for corporate parents to live on the average weekly budget of a care leaver. And everyone was given a challenge pack and told to manage on 24 pounds for five days and share their progress uh, over social media. Halfway through the, the project, everyone got either a windfall or, um, or a challenge, additional challenge where they lost some money. So for example, they got a text saying, you've just um, fallen ill and you, you feel too unwell to take the bus to the doctor. So you need to use five pounds to uh, go to, to take a taxi to the GP. And that was really to illustrate the sort of experiences that care leavers have. All the participants were encouraged to send in budget recipes, which were put into, together into a recipe book for care leavers. And in terms of impact, there were only over 90 people who took part. Like it gained local press attention, erased the profile of care leavers' money worries, and started to generate new ideas about what more could be done locally. Another initiative, which is relatively recent, is what Stockport have been trying to do with setting up community hubs for care leavers. Financial support was an issue, that, and, but also 51% of their care leavers did not feel settled in their neighbourhood. And they were worried that universal credit top up was being phased out and that would have a particular impact on their young people this autumn. So they set up a scheme, which is a pilot with Stockport's uh, local pantry schemes to um, address this. Um, so what it does is basically the community pantry is, is a scheme where you can join, um, pay a joining fee, and then you get access to food, to um, uh, volunteer advice, support with cooking, DIY, and also potential opportunities to volunteer there yourselves. The Leaving Care Service pays the um, initial joining fee and, and the monthly um, costs for care leavers. And um, they hope that that will provide young people with increased links to their neighborhood by linking into the community helping them to feel more settled and secure. But also because you get food, which is equivalent to 20 pounds a week, plus uh, food and vegetables. They also hope that that could help offset some of the, uh, the impact that some young people might have of, of losing the universal credit top up payment. The final area um, of intervention is, is improving accommodation support to help care leavers feel um, safe and settled where they live. We find that a, a lot of um, young people feel unself, uh, unsafe and settled and report that where they live isn't right for them. If we compare across the country, um, the proportion of young people who say that their home is right for them with the the proportion that local authorities report live in suitable accommodation. Those two figures don't match. It's much lower for uh, the kind of self-reported care leavers. And in the Isle of Wight, they did some work trying to engage with care leavers to commission new supported living accommodation. It was a one year project involving care leavers in the whole commissioning process and ensuring it was fit for purpose. They were involved in developing the questions in the tender application form. They were involved in co-hosting information settings with providers, scoring application. And it had a real benefit, not just in terms of ensuring that care leaver had influence over the, the things that were prioritized as part of the um, development of the supported accommodation, but also really demonstrating that care leavers can be involved in those complex decision-making processes and increasing the confidence and making the care leavers who were involved in the process feel listened to. As a participation worker said, it really blew their mind that they were able to have input into something at the strategic level. 
so from our findings, we developed some, some further recommendations. I think there is something around um, a change of culture where corporate parents need to step up to be the best parents that they can be and compensate for the disadvantages that the many care leavers experience. And that involves supporting them emotionally, practically and financially. We also think there needs to be a concerted effort to level up services by identifying and replicating practice in the areas where local authority, where young people are doing well. Um, as this care leave sort of highlighted, it's about the kind of need for a national service that offers the same to everyone. And I suppose it's it's that thing about what can we do to combat the, the postcode lottery that means that some care leave is doing much better than others. There's scope to build on the positive experience that many care leavers reported of, of their leaving care personal advisors, making sure that caseloads are protected and that uh, PAs are supported to give that support to all young people. Because of course, we did still see that there were some young people who had a poorer experiences of, of their leaving care workers. At the same time, I think it's also important to emphasize the sort of role in P that PAs have in helping them to build networks and support a relationship in the wider community and with friends and family and other networks. Because it was also worrying in our findings that there was a proportion of care leavers, about 5%, who didn't have anyone else in their lives providing them with emotional support. And of course, if you're reliant on a service that invariably ends as you get older, that's a real worry. What they've done in um, Coventry to build uh, connection and trust with uh, living care workers is really interesting. We found that when they did the Your Life Beyond Care survey, their care leavers um, actually reported that a higher proportion of them reported that they trusted their personal advisors all or most of the time uh, and felt that they could easily get in touch with their personal advisors compared to other local authorities. And so we explored with them, what is it that you are doing that potentially could be influencing this uh, amongst your uh, care leavers? So the local report, local authority reported that they've invested and actively encouraged the use of social media. So the, having different ways of communicating with young people, personal advisors use WhatsApp, Instagram, the Leaving Care Service has a Facebook page, they have a Kelly Vert apprentice to develop social media links and um, catch ups and interactions are used to as opportunities to check out how young people are feeling. And the PAs really try to act as parents. So, so when they see care leavers, they catch up, spend time together, as opposed to just conducting statutory visits. And personal advisors have their own purchase cards so they can pay for things like a coffee or a meal or perhaps a gift to celebrate the success of something that care leavers have done well. And even when they did the survey, which was during lockdown, again, they used that as an opportunity to be checking in with young people and see how are you doing, how are things. Oldham was another one of the local authorities where we found that a higher proportion of their young people than the national average reported that uh, their care leavers trusted their leaving care workers. And again, we, we asked them, well, what is it that you do that seems to stand out and make this a better experience? So they said they said that they focused on caseload levels to allow um, workers to develop relationships. They've done particular work around training uh, workers to tackle difficult issues such as suicide and how to speak to young people if they're worried about them. They spent some time actually recognizing the work of the Leaving Care Service and sharing the way that they were working with care leavers across the local authority to really promote and recognize and value the work of Leaving Care uh, personal advisors. And they also resource opportunities for workers to 
engage with young people in a different way. So things like doing Thai boxing, having spa days, going mountain walking. We also think that the thing that we need to focus on is addressing that cliff edge of leaving care by investing in leaving care supports and reviewing some of the legal framework and local practices that lead to this massive drop in support when care leave is term 18. It doesn't mirror the way the experience that young people who live at home with their families have. And, and given that this is a group that have potentially particularly high needs, we really need to sort of start thinking about that. And also focusing specifically on young people with disability and long-term health problems. Get to know them and understand the support they need so that we can ensure that we measure the extent of which services work for them. That might mean focusing more on making sure that case management system identify them and so that services can report or scrutinize outcomes for this group. So that was all the findings from the What Makes Life Good survey. But as I said, that's focused on uh, care leavers who completed the survey up until 2019. And of course, after that, we had the pandemic and, uh, and potentially quite a lot of change around the country. And I thought it'd be interesting to just pull out some of the findings from another recent report of care leavers who completed the survey during um, the first lockdown uh, back in March, May 2020. So New Belongings Programme is, is, a, is a national project which uses the Your Life Beyond Care survey to explore how care leavers are feeling and then working together with care leavers on the local uh, level to develop action plans through co-production and we do a bit more intensive work with those eight local authorities who are involved in the program. So as part of that program, we uh, gather the views of over 1200 young people. We had a really good response rate in those local authorities of about on average 50%. And the demographics of, of the young people who completed the survey were roughly similar to the data that we gathered in 2017 to 19. I should say as a caveat though, in terms of looking at these findings, it's, it's not a direct comparison because the New Belongings Local Authorities had not done the Your Life Beyond Care survey before. So it's, it's comparing different authorities in England. And also it was during a very specific time period last year. Uh, most of the surveys were completed in between May, uh, March and May 2020 in that first lockdown. And when we look at national uh, well-being studies of people in the general population, we see that well-being has really fluctuated and changed over the pandemic. So it might be that some of the findings are very much kind of contained to that particular experience. So what do we find? Well. You'd think it would actually make things worse, but in a lot of the findings, we found that the reports from um, the care leavers in this survey was broadly in line with the pre-COVID group. So they had about the same levels of life satisfaction, happiness, loneliness, anxiety, having good friends, having people you could trust, feeling that their accommodation is right for them. Um, but surprisingly, there were certain areas where they actually did better. So they were more likely to report that they were coping financially, that they had access to the internet and could afford their mobile phones, that they had emotional support from their personal advisors, had pets, they had lower uh, average stress scores and felt that they could handle uh, problems. Uh, they were in, similar to the previous findings, there was really positive feedback around their leaving care workers. And it was a bright spot for several local authorities. Basically, a bright spot means that they were doing um, statistically significantly better than the average that we've seen across the country. Uh, so um, a higher proportion of care leavers said that their leaving care workers gave them emotional support than pre-pandemic. And it was a higher than average 
uh, percentage of young people who trusted their personal advisors in five of the eight local authorities. That said, it still doesn't mean that it was perfect across the board for, because of course there were still young people who felt that they couldn't trust their workers. Um, and all the three quarters reported they, they could easily get in touch with their workers, there was still a quarter who, who couldn't. Also in terms of finances, as I said, there was a lower proportion who felt that they found it difficult to cope financially compared to um, the pre-pandemic example, but it's still a higher proportion than in the general population. And the sort of the comments from young people were sort of mixed messages around this, that there were some things that uh, made it easier to, to manage financially and certain, certain things that made it, made it worse for them. So I, I suppose for us, what, looking at this data, we uh, thought that there's some surprising um, potentially surprising findings that suggest that initially the pandemic didn't appear to worsen care livers experiences in many areas. And perhaps that's partially because there were some protective factors of the additional support that was put in during this period. We know that there were national investment in things like the universal credit uplift, the furlough scheme that was introduced. There was additional support for care leavers in England around digital access, increased access to the internet, about uh, providing them with laptops, and there was a lot of practical and financial support from local authorities and even care workers. Um, the local authorities that we worked with reported things like using uh, the PAs who had credit cards, who could do online shopping and provide extra things for young people. Um, they increased levels of contact, there were lots of sort of online um, support that was provided, groups and things to combat loneliness. And there was a greater focus in many areas around care leavers' well-being, which may have mitigated some of the negative impact that, that could have the, the pandemic could have caused, at least initially. But I think also what it tells us is that the work um, of creating the best support for our care leavers is far from done because although it didn't get worse, it maintained those kind of higher levels that were worse than the general population, worse than children in care. And we really need to continue to support care leavers in those areas that are important to them. And it suggests to me that we need to think about really investing in care leavers and that some of the things that were put, put in place during the pandemic could maybe give us a glimpse of what we can do to make things better given the levels of investment that is made into children in, whilst they're in care and that cliff edge that care leavers report when they leave care relatively small investments in care leavers could potentially make all the difference for example, if we're reducing the financial stress of living independently on a low income, with a modest contribution of something like £20 top up each week, which I know some local authorities are doing, or providing additional support uh, that, that many parents give to their children when they leave home, things like buying a computer, a mobile phone and paying for broadband, which were things that were put in place during the pandemic. So what next? Um, we continue to run the Your Life, Your Care and Your Life Beyond Care surveys with local authorities. Um, we're currently working with one local authority in Wales and about um, 10 in, in England. We still have some uh, spaces for this year. So if anyone is interested in, in becoming involved or hearing more about the project, then you can just get in touch with us. Um, we have also, uh, developed an online practice bank of how local authorities have sought to address uh, children in care and care leavers well-being so I gave you a sample of some of those today but there's much more on our website that you can go and have a look at. In England there's there's you might know that there is a uh, independent review for children of social care going on and we're trying to use the findings from the Brightwells program to inform that to really share what is happening to children in care and care based on their perspective. 
Um, we're also working on a similar analysis to the one I was describing earlier um, for care leavers uh, into children in care that hopefully will be coming out in the new year. So that's everything from me. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and we'll see if there's some questions. Thank, thank you very, very much, Linda. That was really fascinating and interesting. Um, I, I guess it raises lots of questions and thinks, makes me think about, you know, how we're different in Wales as well. I guess one uh, thing I was really thinking about and came up in a previous piece of research that I did is what about young people not feeling good about how they look and what kind of projects have been taken forward to work on that? Or if anyone has, so I'd be interested to know about that, Linda. Yes, I think it's it's a particularly tricky one that local authorities sometimes feel a bit uncomfortable with because they don't sort of it's it's a new one for for them to sort of explore. Um, in again in Sheffield, there was there was some interesting work done with their children in care around that domain where they developed a fashion show uh, to um, promote positive body image uh, and positive messages. Their young people worked with. Um, I think it is like a dance coach to help them sort of move and present themselves in a positive way. They chose music. They uh, invited all, all the younger children, uh, uh, did lots of sort of positive um, messages around, uh, around feeling good about yourself and uh, etc. cetera. Um, so that's the only example of, of local authority that, that sort of specifically addressed body image that, that I know of today. But we, we are really interested in, in finding out more and examples of other local authorities who might have focused on that uh, more, because I think it's, it's one of those uh, areas that perhaps is, is a little bit neglected um, in terms of, of care leavers and children in care's experience. Yeah, I guess I was thinking about making clothes might be a really interesting one as well. But um, we yeah. do have um, some questions in the um, chat, Linda, so I don't want to take over. Um, people are asking Tracy Stanley and David Owen whether there's any cost to the local authorities having a survey in their area. Yes, there is. So when we did the uh, surveys in Wales, we did it as a pilot um, initially uh, together with uh, the Children's Commissioner for Wales and the Welsh Government and at that point there wasn't a cost uh, because it was covered by them but but now um, anyone who sort of joins the programme there is a cost uh, associated with which essentially just covers our costs in terms of running the survey and you get a package of support so you get access to the survey we do a lot of work with individual local authorities to support them to think about um, how they are going to roll it out um, to make sure that they get the best possible response rates and lots of feedback uh, and meetings. And then we also do disseminational events to help them to sort of think about the findings and how they can use them. And obviously we also um, have um, trained analysts who, do, who analyze all the data and give you a sort of very detailed report about your care relievers experience. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, we've got a question here from uh, Natalie Edelman um, about whether there was any difference in well-being between care leavers transitioning from care who'd been placed out of county and although also um, young people who were unaccompanied asylum seekers. Just think, just mentions the note about lack of social and familial support for those groups. Yes, yeah, so we haven't we haven't been able there's a limit to how many questions we can ask in a survey just to make it short enough for people want to want to complete it so we don't actually ask about out of area we did pilot in one local authority not for care leavers but for children in care looking at um, a difference in experiences between those two groups and in that particular local authority there wasn't a difference um, but it's not something that we systematically looked at similarly around unaccompanied asylum seeking children. We did originally in our pilot for children in care have a question about asylum status. But when we um, piloted it, many of the children felt really uncomfortable about that question and worried about what was gonna to happen to their data, whether it would be shared with the home office. And so we actually, we don't ask that question um, for that reason, because, because the young people sort of didn't feel comfortable asking that question. And so we, we're not able to distinguish between 
um, asylum seekers and, and other young people. Uh, although when you look at some of the comments, there are, we can see some of the sort of US experience as part of that. So certainly in terms of, I know, for example, when in children, in our children in care data, we've seen things like differences in, in family contact and, and how, how young people feel about that with particular reports around when you look at the qualitative data around um, it'd be really tricky to to have, be in contact with your family uh, on a regular basis that you may not know what is going on with them because they're out of the country they haven't been traced and and, and that kind of causing particular difficulties but it's not yeah it's not something that we can look at systematically because it's not uh, one of the questions Okay, thank you, um, Linda. There's a question here from Bridget. Um, in her work, that, uh, her research, she's found that a lot of young people talk to her about the impact of bullying, and she wondered if that came out in your studies at all? So we don't look at it. It wasn't one of the focuses of for care leavers, because that's not one of the things that they highlighted as most important to them, but it is a question in the Children in Care survey. So we ask um, in that survey about whether young people feel afraid of going to school because of bullying. Uh, again, that we, we're doing some more in-depth analysis of the children in care data, but it certainly is something that's prevalent. And, and in a lot of the sort of written comments, there seem to be uh, people highlighting particularly the sort of link with bullying and, and stigma, um, be it where um, another sort of key thing that a lot of young people highlighted in, in the younger age group was about adults doing things that made them feel embarrassed about being in care. I think one of the first local authorities we worked with, um, one of the children um, said, I hate it when um, my, the school register comes up and it says CLA next to my name, identifying that I'm a child in care. And so, so a lot of those kind of things have come up as part of the work that we do uh, and, and local authorities looking to address those kind of issues of, of children perhaps being taken out of classes and um, to, to do uh, reviews or um, young people, um, social workers coming with badges and kind of um, identifying them as care experience when they didn't feel kind of comfortable that being shared with their friends, etc. So there seems to be a bit of a link between those two things. Okay, thank you, um, Linda. There's a question here from Alice. She's about to do some work investigating social support um, for young people leaving care. And she asks, aside from setting up clubs, you know, the football and the allotment group, for example, are there any other examples that you're aware of of good practice um, in terms of maintaining connections over the transition period, for example, with trusted members of staff or foster carers? So I think, I mean, I think there are lots of those good initiatives like the um, uh, Lifelong Links project and, and uh, things that focus on exploring who are in your wider social network and how can we maintain those relationships. I think that links to both the things that are happening whilst you're in care, that you're not sort of severing too many relationships by moving children frequently when that up considering to the, their relationships with um, in the wider community, but then also sort of initiatives while there are care leavers for thinking about how you can sort of foster better relationships. I know North Yorkshire have done things around, um, I think it's essentially using family group conferencing to help care leavers build relationship with family, et cetera, to sort of, and, but they can also be I think wider than, than sort of birth family can also be other people that have been important to you that you identify that you want to develop relationships with and, and those kind of things. Okay and I mean I have a question which um, I, I'll often ask is about is about pets really Linda and how important they were to young people what they said about the importance of them I guess um, but also any initiatives to take that forward because I guess if you're in housing it's not always possible to have pets in housing. Yeah so I, I agree it's definitely something that um, in development both of the children in care and the Cali survey and all the focus groups pets came up as, as something that was really important for that well-being and um, and I think there is a lot to be said for kind of thinking about 
the you know, if you're developing things like housing you know projects can you actually look at the rules that mean that young people can and can't have pets um but we've also seen um sort of initiatives around linking children and young people to animals in the community so i know that when we we worked with one local authority in london um where it was very difficult to sort of potentially for people of social housing there were rules around not having pets etc and they would say well we have a community farm can we link uh, children to the community farm and provide them with in initiatives in that way it always surprises me when we ask about the things that you want to do um that in terms of having fun for care leavers um and things that you want to do more of uh, horseback riding comes up a lot so interesting about kind of initiatives of, of enabling care leavers to do that, which obviously isn't about having a pet at home, but it's about sort of linking into um, initiatives in the community. Okay, and there's just a comment here from uh, Laura, who's working with a young person who's about to leave care and is desperate to get a pet, but is told she can't be housed um, because of limited spaces and with a pet. Um, but yeah, she, she says she'll take forward that suggestion about connecting with animals in the community, I guess. An obvious one would be dog walking schemes, wouldn't it? And walking dogs for the elderly in the local community and making those kind of links, I guess. But uh, I don't know if we've got any final questions for um, Linda. We've got about another, just a couple of minutes, if anybody's got anything, burning questions they'd like um, to ask. Okay. I can't I can't um, see any more popping up at the moment, uh, Linda. So it, that was absolutely fascinating. It will be recorded so um, people will have access to the slides so they can go away and also look at the links to the different resources that have been developed. So really enjoyed your talk. It was very helpful. And thank you very, very much for giving us your time again. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.